Welcome to the 191st monthly meeting of the New York Linux Users Group. Thanks for showing up. Um, tonight we're going to be hearing a talk on radical ideas from the practice of cloud systems administration um, by our uh, speaker, Tom Limoncelli, who you may know from his books including uh, Time Management for Systems Administrators, which is a classic, and The Practice of Cloud Systems Administration, which is the book I was just asking about. Um, um, I'd like to uh, say how much we appreciate uh, Bloomberg, our space host, for allowing us to use this, uh, this room and the facilities. Um, and i uh, also like to say thank you to everybody who has uh, shown up, taking the opportunity to, uh, to be with us tonight. Tonight, before we get started, we have uh, some usual requests. The first one is make sure your cell phones are on silent. Uh, so take a moment to do that. And the second is if you have any snacks that are in noisy wrappers, um, please uh, either put them away, finish them up, throw them out, but just don't continue to eat them during the presentation. The noise is very disruptive. And the last thing is we're going to do questions at the end. Um, so please, uh, at, when Tom comes to the conclusion of his presentation, if you will just line up at these microphones, they'll be turned on and you can ask your question and um, it'll, all, it'll all be just fine. Um, at the end of the... Um, at the end of this, there will also be, there will also be trivia questions. So if, if you're paying attention, Tom will uh, ask six of the eight questions he's prepared, his choice. And um, you will get either a choice of one of the three books we have or three ebook vouchers we have from O'Reilly. So if you are still here at the end, and I hope you will be, then you will be able to um, participate in that as well. Uh, so in addition uh, to our space sponsor, Bloomberg, I'd like to thank our other sponsors, uh, past and present, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and O'Reilly Media for their support. Uh, in addition, Nylog would not be able to function without our many volunteers who've contributed greatly over the years. Um, after the meeting, we uh, are going to be going over to Bloom's Tavern over on 58th Street. Um, so you can, we will be going out in groups. Uh, you can just go out with a group of people, or if you know the place, go right in. We have the upstairs reserve starting at around 8, 8.30ish, I believe, so after the meeting, you can just go on up. Um, I also want to mention that our next meeting will be uh, Daniel Kahn Gilmore, and the presentation's title is GNU PG and the Future of PGP. Now, this is a little unusual. This will be a Friday, May 29th, here at Bloomberg. Friday is an unusual date for us. We hope it'll work for you uh, if you're interested. Um, but we know it can be a little difficult, but hopefully uh, you'll be able to be here for that. Um, so I have a couple of announcements, and then I'll open uh, the floor up to uh, announcements I know other people have. Uh, first, uh, the workshops. Please talk to uh, Rob or David Bristow, who are right here, if you are interested in the NILAC workshops. Um, uh, talk to them afterwards uh, if you'd like to know more about them. Uh, they are happening at City, uh, City College at 138th Street in Amsterdam. Uh, the next two workshops, is that correct? Okay, great. Uh, the next two workshops are on the 21st of April and the 5th of May, and that will appear on our Meetup page. Um, and in case you missed it, there are Linux DVDs uh, out front. Uh, you can just grab one there for you to try out and for you to keep. In addition, Tom has discount uh, cards for this book that he will be uh, you know, on which this talk is at least somewhat based. Um, and so, if you are interested that that you in that, you can get a discount uh, by grabbing one of those cards. Um, in the audience, I think we have a couple of announcements I know about. Um, I actually want to open up uh, community announcements by saying there will be a DevOps Days NYC, April 30th and May 1st. Go to DevOps Days NYC, uh, sorry, DevOpsDays.org and click on the New York link if you are interested. Um, there are still uh, opportunities to both sponsor and to attend. It's a small cost. It's $100. So uh, if you want to participate and you can get those days off from work, then uh, I'd encourage you to give it a shot if that's uh, anywhere in your professional interest. Other announcements? Uh, April 30th and May 1st, so Thursday and Friday. Um, one, okay, come on. On a similar theme, um, I'm really stoked to uh, announce that we're going to host the first Container Days on the East Coast, unfortunately just slightly up the coast in Boston, but that's on uh, June 5th, 6th. Similar principle, half price, actually 50 bucks to attend. Um, no, it's two days. It's a Friday and Saturday. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's basically DevOps days around containers and dynamic infrastructure. It's a community nonprofit. There's half presentations, half open spaces. We've got some great speakers. Search Container Days Boston 2015 Eventbrite, because if you don't put the Eventbrite on, you'll get lots of dates when the trash gets collected in Boston, which isn't really that useful. Container Days, yeah. Anyway... Um, but yeah, no, uh, definitely give it a shot if you're interested in that space. We've got some great people showing up, and it would be great to have the community there because that's what it's about. 
June 5th, 6th uh, in Boston. And I know we have another uh, announcement back here. Hey, my name is Jacob Sherman. I just wanted to make a quick announcement. I'm volunteering for this organization called Scripted. They're always looking for volunteers. They teach uh, coding, mostly front-end coding, in low-income and underdeveloped, uh, underserved schools around New York City. And also in the summer, a very important part of the program is to give internships to the students. And they've had great success, and they're actually in great need of internships for this summer. So if you have any interest, uh, I'll be here. I'll put a link on the website, and I'll try to hang out at the back towards the end of the meetup. And in case he has, has to leave, so he will post a link on the meetup page for this uh, for this event. So go look there if you're interested, if you don't get a chance to, to meet up tonight. Rob? One last event. <clears throat> All right. So this weekend at, <clears throat> sorry, uh, this weekend is the Vintage Computer Fest East 10. Uh, it's April 17th through April 19th. It's in Wall, New Jersey. Um, if you're interested in seeing what they have over there, there's um, events, workshops. They're going to show off a uh, PDP-8. There's some keynote talks. Uh, go to vintage.org slash 2015 slash east for more information and to buy tickets. Again, vintage.org slash 2015 slash east. Does anyone have any other announcements? Oh, it's too bad. We've had we've gone entire months without any announcements, so it's really great to have people come on up with with things to announce. Um, so, um, can we get the house lights down a little bit? And um, please welcome Tom Limoncelli with radical ideas from the practice of cloud system administration. Everybody. Hi. Good evening. Thank you for uh, the introduction. And uh, how's everybody doing tonight? Awesome. So um, let me just make some quick AV adjustments. Uh, beautiful. So uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, a, a number of different ideas from my new book, uh, The Practice of Cloud System Administration. Uh, but first, I'm going to talk about my other favorite topic, which is me. Um, <laughs> I, I feel like on this screen I'll be talking about this, and at the same time on this screen I'll be talking about the exact same thing. Um, so who am I? Um, I've been a system administrator for much too long. Um, I've worked at a lot of big companies like Google and Bell Labs and some, a lot of smaller companies you probably haven't heard of. Uh, I now work at Stack, uh, Stack Exchange. How many people here are familiar with stackoverflow.com? One, two, okay, like some of you. Okay, good, good. Um, glad to hear it. Uh, I think um, every time you use Stack Overflow, you probably save about four minutes. And if you multiply that by all of our users, we're saving millions of hours of, uh, of, product, of uh, programmer time every day. I think that's awesome. Um, I also blog and I tweet and I write way too many books. Um, people have been asking, why do we call this volume two? Uh, that's because uh, this book, my first book, The Practice of System and Network Administration, is eventually going to be rebranded as volume one. Um, so, <laughs> but uh, in, that, might be, that might take a year or two. So um, often when you invite an author to come speak at a meetup, it's just a thinly veiled advertisement for their book. And... Um, that's not going to be this talk. If, if it were, I would have a slide like this and I'd stand here until someone took a picture and tweeted it. <laughs> okay. Um, and also, if it were that kind of talk, I'd like give you the hard sell and explain that it's really two books in one. The first half is on designing big systems and the second half is about running those big systems. Um, but we're not just going to talk about uh, the book. In, instead, uh, I'm going to talk about the title, which um, came from the marketing department at Pearson. Um, they said, you really want to have the word cloud in the title. And I said, well, you know, it's, it's, it's about more than that. But then I thought about it. And, you know, the cloud's pretty awesome, right? You know, the cloud. <laughs> the cloud. Um, the cloud. Um, the cloud, yes, and you know, I mean, 
we heart the cloud, right? I mean, everyone hearts the cloud, right? Who, raise your hand if you heart the cloud. Yeah, we all heart the cloud. And, and why do we heart the cloud? It's very simple. We heart the cloud because the cloud solves all problems, right? <laughs> there, there are no problems left in the world now that we have the cloud. I mean, the cloud is so awesome. Um, and uh, the, the problem, though, is that the cloud is this marketing thing that has been taken over, and it, it, it means different things to different people, right? In fact, there's really three common interpretations of the cloud that I hear. Um, to, to consumers, to consumers, it means putting your data on someone else's computer, right? I have my music in the cloud, and that means I can listen to it on any of my devices, on my laptop, my phone, whatever. And executives tend to have a very different definition. They think of the cloud as elastic computing, right? This, this amazing ability you know, in the past to get uh, one machine in the data center took a year of battling IT, and now I can get a machine in AWS, or I can get 500 machines for a week, and when I'm done with them, maybe some ad campaign or something that lasted a week, I can give them back to Amazon. And that kind of elastic computing, being able to shrink and grow dynamically, is a game changer for people. But to computer scientists, the cloud means distributed computing. And that's really what this book is about, because when we build these large systems, and small systems too, uh, we are generally talking about distributed computing. So I'm going to talk a little about distributed computing, and then I'm going to talk about three things that uh, uh, might challenge your, your, um, your experience. So to understand distributed computing, um, you know, everyone, this, this slide is like in every presentation you see nowadays, right? You know, computers used to be big, yada, yada. And, but the, the important thing that I want to draw your attention to here is computers used to be this thing that you went to, right? If you had computing to do, you would go to the computer, you would do your computing, and you would take your results away, right? And even when computers got smaller, they were still this thing that you had to go to. Um, but then networks came. And networks begat client-server computing, where we take the functionality of something and we split it. We split the functionality into the server part and the client part. So the first email system I ever used was on a mainframe, and it was not client-server computing. The software running there handled storing the email, uh, email composition, routing, the address book, everything, right? But in client-server computing, the server is doing just the serving and the routing and those functions and the uh, user interface composition, spell checking, which we didn't have on the mainframe. That all is happening um, on the client. And as you all know, this model was very successful. And it was so successful for many reasons. Particularly, it scaled really well. You can add more clients and you can independently scale the server. And servers got bigger and bigger and bigger and eventually, they couldn't scale anymore. And even though they get bigger every year, they, they, it wasn't keeping pace. And so as a result, in the late 90s, people realized, well, what if we distribute that work instead of on one computer? What if we distribute that work over many computers? Right? And that was the, the birth of distributed computing. And so, um, so you have examples like, genomics, where you might take hundreds of computers, each of them gets a fraction of the data set, does their computation, and the results roll up to some master that, that sorts out the results. Or a web service. For example, um, I mentioned I work at Stack Exchange. Our main web service is actually um, uh, distributed over 10 web servers with a load balancer. I know that's surprising to a lot of people that we're the 50th largest site according to Quantcast, but we actually only have 10 front ends. So each of those machines gets one-tenth of the traffic and processes those web requests. And computing, uh, more than computing can be distributed, right? So storage can be distributed. So Gmail doesn't have one big machine with all the Gmails in it, right? It has thousands of machines. Um, each one stores a, a fraction of the messages. Uh, now, the 
And the cool thing about distributed computing is they can do more work than any single computer. And I can, the, the proof for this is kind of a tautology. If you came to me and said, Tom, you're wrong. Here I have built a computer that can do more work than your distributed computer, I'd say, great, I'm going to buy 10 of those, turn it into a distributed compute network, and again, I'm right, distributed computing can do more work than you, right? And it can do, so it can do more storage, more compute power, can have more memory, or more throughput in general. Um, now, the problem is that with more computers, you have more problems. And in fact, uh, these were some of the challenges in the late 90s, early aughts, and, and actually still to today. Um, but in the late 90s, people started to discover this when um, people in the distributed computing world uh, started to realize that when you have thousands of users in a using you know, a single service, you have bigger risks, right? Um, you know, my first email server, if it went down, you know, 100, 200 people were upset. But if Gmail goes down, it's a headline in the New York Times the next day, right? So not only are the risks bigger, but those failures are more visible. Also, distributed computing realized that automation is mandatory. At some sites, especially small sites, automating might be you know, a nice to have, right? I can walk to each machine and do a software upgrade. If I have tens of thousands of machines, I can't do that. If you're Google or Facebook, you could not hire enough people to do things manually. You, literally, the company wouldn't exist. Um, and also, cost containment becomes really critical. If you're buying one server and you accidentally buy the fancy video card, which is kind of a waste because no one's going to ever look at the monitor, um, OK, you spend 50 extra bucks. But if you, if you make that mistake on a network of 10,000 machines, that's $50 times 10,000. Now you're talking some real money. So cost containment becomes critical. Now, the distributed computing world found a lot of crazy different ideas uh, or solutions to these kind of problems. So uh, in distributed computing, you don't just talk about managing risk. Um, new paradigms have been invented. Uh, people like John Ospal at Etsy uh, talk about uh, safety. Can this complex system be safely administered? Um, reliability becomes a competitive differentiator. Studies have found that people don't go to websites that are down. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> people don't go to websites that are down. Um, and not only that, but remember the, the original, you know, like the old days of the web, you know, sites would go down for two hours. And in those two hours, they would lose their customers, right? They'd say, oh, there's, there's five other sites that offer that. And they'd try them, and they'd find out, and, and they, they wouldn't come back, right? So it was a competitive differentiator. Uh, new paradigms for automation have been invented. And I know there's been talks here about Puppet and, and other things. Um, and also new paradigms for cost and thinking about the, the, the economies of scale. So, for example, Facebook, Google, and these other companies build their own hardware because they've discovered that vertical integration is the only way that they can get um, exactly what they want at the cost that they want. Um, but the most interesting thing to me about distributed computing is that we've discovered that everything fails. I mean, a one, an, a, a one in a million problem or a, a problem that has a one in a million chance of happening happens eight times in a day, right, at the right frequency. Or, you know, if a hard disk has a 100,000 hour mean time between failures and you have 100,000 hard drives, that means on average every hour you have a hard disk failing, right? So if your paradigm was, well, hard drives almost never fail, and if they do, we'll rush someone over to change the disk, that's three shifts full time, seven days a week doing that. So you have to come up with new, new ways of thinking about these failures. And, and everything fails. Parts, you know, little CPUs and RAM chips, parts fail. Networks fail. Entire systems fail. Also, code is imperfect. If you, um, you know that there's going to be bugs. Um, and at large scale, you need ways of working around them 
for a few hours or days before the before the um, uh, the developers can you know fix the actual bug. And also, people are imperfect, right? Can a system be safely administered if it's really, really large? Well, you need to make a system that's resilient to those kind of failures also. In other words, you need to learn how to fail better. If failures are going to happen a lot, you better be good at it. You better be good at handling it. So when I was um, researching the book, um, I kept seeing references to the, the Lucent 5 ESS phone, phone system, which was prided as one of the most reliable computing systems in the world. This is what drove 80% of the international phone system. And there were some 5ESS phone switches that uh, had three years of perfect uptime. I thought, wow, that's amazing. I, I, should, I should research this a little, because that'd be a good case study for the book. How many people here ever administered a 5E? Anyone? We're, we're, OK, interesting. Oh, kind of. OK, um, so it turns out that the way that these units got three years continuous uptime is the definition of uptime said that if it was scheduled, if it was down for scheduled maintenance, it didn't count. <laughs> so yes, they had best of breed in testing and high quality parts and all these other things, but um, the thing still had to come down for maintenance occasionally. So, um, and, and that's not acceptable on the web. Though, remember when the web was new and sites would say, you know, we'll be down Saturday from noon till two o'clock for a software upgrade, right? Remember those days? And people at, you know, tech publications would sit there clicking reload until the site came back up to be, because they were gonna be the first to write an article about the new features, right? You, that's. I, I gave this talk recently at a school, and these kids were, were too young to remember any of that. And they were like, no, you're making stuff up, right? Like, no, no, that's, that was the web. But that's not acceptable today. Um, so, uh, so the book covers lots of different techniques for designing systems that don't have all these problems. But I want to focus the rest of my time uh, talking about three particular things. Um, and these are three things that will help you all make your systems more reliable. And the three bits of advice I have are you should use cheaper, less reliable hardware. If a process or procedure is risky, do it a lot. And don't punish people for outages. Now, how many people here think that I'm saying these are mistakes that companies make and I'm going to recommend the opposite? Anyone? Okay. Good, because this, these are the actual uh, recommendations I'm going to make. So let's start with the first one. Use cheaper, less reliable hardware. And I'm going to explain this by way of analogy. I travel a lot, and I often rent cars. And as you know, when you rent a car, they offer you insurance, right? Four different kinds of insurance often. And it would be fiscally irresponsible for me to get all four kinds of insurance when I rent a car, especially since my personal auto insurance covers any rental car that I get. And my homeowner's insurance covers any rental car that I get. And if I rent it using an Amex, it covers any rental car I get, right? It would be fiscally irresponsible of me to get all these insurance and be overprotected because that is spending money at every layer instead of just the layer that you need. So let me tell you about the 10 million times people have come to me and said, we're, we're building a website and we want advice about our design. And they say, I say, well, what are your plans so far? And they say, well, we're going to buy a high-end server because you know the high-end servers have great uptime. OK, uh, I won't disagree with you yet. And um, we're going to put RAID because we want the storage to be reliable. And we're going to get the dual power supply option because um, you know, we don't want a single point of failure. And we're going to put it on a UPS. And we're going to get the gold maintenance package, right? Four hour response time. The most ex Well, there might be one more expensive. but um, And we're going to get five of these machines and put it behind a load balancer. 
what do we, oh, but you know, if you put it behind a load balancer, the software we've written so far doesn't really support that. So we're going to have to invest some time in coding to um, change our software so that it works in a distributed environment. Okay, we're pretty good, but we're missing one thing. Anyone guess? Right, we're going to buy a second load balancer, of course. And this is, this is the typical design. This is what any vendor would recommend. Any, sales, any salesperson on commission would recommend this. And, <laughs> and that is spending money at every layer, right? Okay, so the issue here is that if, you're, if you've written the code to make your software work in a distributed environment, if you're doing your resiliency through software, then you don't need to do it in hardware. Now, often we don't have a choice. You know, we might have an architecture, the, the, our only choice is to do our resiliency through hardware. But when given a choice, the distributed world found it's best to do it in software because you write it once and you deploy it to as many machines as you want. If you do your resiliency through hardware, you're paying for that hardware every single time, right? It's like that uh, extra cost video card. Um, so you can get the best hardware in the world, but if you have to write code to make the system distributed, you're double spending. And so we wanna try to eliminate that whenever we can. Um, and in fact, when we do that, instead of focusing on the most resilient hardware at this layer, we can focus on the most efficient hardware at this layer. So for example, um, I know some sites, you know, every time their salesperson says, well, I can make it more resilient with a little more money, they say, oh, uh, okay, here's more money, or at least they're tempted to spend that more money. Compare that to the paper that Facebook published last summer where they said because they have put their resiliency at the load balancer level, they can focus on efficiency and they actually benchmarked what's the most efficient server. Is it a small, a small number of high power servers or many, many uh, low power servers? Like they benchmarked ARM chips versus Intel and other things. And they were able to take all costs into account. So if you have twice as many machines, they're smaller physically, but there's more floor space required. And floor space costs more. If they had to build twice as many data centers, that would be more expensive. Um, they looked at, so floor space, power, cooling, initial purchase price, maintenance costs, et cetera. And they're able to take the whole view into account. And in fact, when you start doing this, you start thinking in terms of sustainability and efficiency instead of, um, well, I will callously call it spending more money to always get more resiliency, right? And these techniques that were developed, uh, that came out of the distributed computing world work really well whether you're in a big grid environment or um, everyday, you know, enterprise systems. They're all trickling down to the enterprise. So, however, there's a caveat, they're much more, most of these techniques, I'd say about half the techniques in the book are more cost effective at large scale. So if you have two machines behind a load balancer, you have to keep a certain amount of headroom available because if this machine dies, there has to be headroom left over on the other machine to take up the slack. And in a large environment, you have 89, 90% utilization uh, because if one of these fails, the other nine are gonna take up the slack. Approximately, the, you know, it's not, exact math. Um, and so this is why, for example, Dropbox can give uh, people storage for free or, at a very, or enterprises at a low cost compared to, you know, if you build your own file server, um, you're going to be, you're going to be in this camp and Dropbox is in that camp. Um, and a lot of that efficiency comes from starting with an SLA and buying just enough resiliency to meet that SLA. An SLA tells you when to stop, right? And then you can focus on other things like features and maintenance and automation. Um, 
And as I said before, load balancing is just one resiliency technique that came out of the distributed computing world. Um, one of the funniest stories that I've ever heard is uh, from an early time at Google, actually before I worked there, um, they were doing this, um, they needed large amounts of RAM. And for this project, they were, um, they were holding large amounts of data in RAM, <clears throat> and they were holding so much in RAM that, uh, you know, double, double parity RAM uh, will detect all but like one in 10 trillion errors, something like that. Um, but they had enough RAM that one in 10 trillion errors was happening, happening a lot. So they built into their system uh, software-based resiliency. They were hashing, taking hashes of their data structures, and they could detect if RAM chips were dying. And they were marking those RAM chips as bad, and even across reboots, those RAM chips weren't reused by the kernel. And so they didn't have to replace a machine when a RAM chip died. They had to re replace the machine when you know, enough of the RAM chips died to make it unusable. So that was really cool. But what's really cool is their purchasing department was able to stop buying the high quality RAM chips and buy the consumer grade RAM chips, which saved even more money. <clears throat> and then someone in their purchasing department thought, well, wait, he, he called the RAM chip company. They, they were buying direct at this point. <clears throat> And uh, he said, so do you have like two assembly lines, like one that makes the, uh, the gold chips and one that makes the consumer grade chips? And they said, oh, no, it's one factory. If they pass all the QA tests, we sell them as the high, high end RAM. If they pass most of the tests, they're, they're sold as the consumer grade. And he said, awesome. So what do you do with the ones that don't pass a lot of the tests? <laughs> you know. The ones that, you know, they boot up, but you wouldn't sell them under your own brand. And they said, well, we, we throw those away. He said, would you sell them to us? And they said, sure, we'll sell them to you at pennies on the dollar. So now Google is buying these crap RAM chips, and they're able to use them pennies on the dollar. Now, Google starts to, uh, and, and this, by the way, is why Google was so fast. Remember when Google started? It was amazing that search results were taking less than a second. I mean, at that time, a lot of search engines took, you know, 30 seconds to give you your results, or, you know, even 10 seconds. Or the Archie search engine, which you would email your query, and uh, within the week, you would get your, a reply by email. Who remembers Archie? Okay. Yeah. So, um, so now their competition realizes that, oh, speed's a competitive advantage. We have to be as fast as Google. So they start buying, uh, putting their search database in RAM, and they're buying their RAM chips at full price because they didn't, they didn't take the time to do this software-based resiliency, right? So competitive advantage, do, do it in software. So have I convinced you to use cheaper, less reliable hardware? Some of you. Okay. <laughs> okay, good. Part two, if a process is risky or do it a lot. Um, and I say this because I make a distinction between risky behavior and risky procedures. Now, a risky, something that is risky behavior is inherently risky. I can't help you with it. It's always going to be risky. But risky procedures can be improved. So here are some risky behaviors, right? I can't really improve these. They're just inherently risky, right? You know, letting children play with matches, inherently risky. But procedures that are risky get better the more you practice, right? So here are four procedures that are risky that strike fear in the hearts of system administrators. But if you do them often enough, you get good at them and you find the edge cases, you document them better, you maybe automate them, you script them, and they get less risky. And you only find those improvements by doing the procedures over and over again. So I mentioned I work at Stack Exchange, and uh, I've been there about two years now. When I joined, uh, when the, you know, they were explaining to me the architecture. It's not very distributed at the moment. We're getting there, but um, it mostly runs out of our New York data center. And if there's a major problem, we can fail over to our data center in Oregon. 
And I said, great, show me the failover procedure. Like, uh, um, you know, I, I want to do it. And they said, well, it's, uh, that's a bit of a story. I said, no, no, I, so I, I'm, I'm on the, the Linux side. A lot of people don't realize that Stack Exchange is one of the few uh, websites in the top 100 that is actually uh, a mixed Windows and Linux uh, website. So the HTML pages that you see are generated Windows, IIS, C Sharp, believe it or not. Um, and with a Microsoft SQL Server database. But to make all that scale, it is surrounded by Linux for caching and load balancing and security and configuration management. Or as I like to say, we have a soft Microsoft center surrounded by a hard Linux shell. <laughs> <laughs> and so I said, now I understand you, we're, we're using the SQL server from Microsoft and so the failover, oh, and we're paying for the always on, you know, what is, availability group feature. So, you know, Microsoft, I'm, I'm not a super Windows expert, but I, I understand, you know, everything in Microsoft is a button click. So show me what button I click to fail over to the Oregon data center. And I said, well, Tom, it's not that simple. I mean, the database, yes, it is that that simple, but to do the failover, you have to coordinate it with changes to um, uh, Redis and HAProxy and all these other things. And I said, okay, well, I still need to learn this. Show me. And he's, well, actually, our Oregon data center is kind of in a state right now, and we can't show you today. <laughs> so, so we start working on this, and, and we get Oregon up to up to speed. And um, and I'm told this is. We, we schedule a, a Saturday where we're going to do a fire drill. We're going to, you know, if kids can do fire drills at school, we can do fire drills, and we're going to do the failover. And um, they said, this should take an hour or two. And so we go to do it, and it took 10 hours. Most of that time was waiting. You know, uh, developers were, like, fixing code and, and stuff as, as we were sitting around waiting. Um, the system administrators also breaking and fixing things. Um, we also learned that it required hands-on by three different teams. The, there were certain things that could not be done at, at that time, could not be done just by the site reliability team. Uh, during those 10 hours, we filed more than 30 bugs. Some were big code change kind of bugs. Others were like just simple, like documentation improvement suggestions, that kind of thing. We also learned that the process could not be done if Nick was on vacation. <laughs> Nick was our single point of failure. Yes. Now, as I so in other words, this process was incredibly risky, right? And luckily, we discovered this on a Saturday when we were all there and ready, as opposed to 4 a.m. on a Tuesday morning when there's a, a hurricane or, or something knocking at our New York data center. So we started a process where every couple months we were going to do another drill. And as I said, the first time it took 10 hours, more than 30 bugs were failed. The next drill, we got it down to five hours, only 20 bugs were filed. The next time we did in two hours and only 12 bugs were filed. And the last time we did it, it took one hour, five bugs were failed, mostly by me because I whine a lot. Um, I hope that this time next year, I'll be able to say it's one minute and we do it with no bugs, or um, maybe years from now, it'll be zero minutes because we'll be in a fully distributed master-master environment and it'll just all happen magically. But we wouldn't get to where we are today without practicing these procedures over and over. And the, so the reason that this is better, or this is important, is that every time you do the drill, it surfaces many different issues. It's also important because each member got a turn at being the person doing the failing over. And as our team grows, when I, when I joined, it was like three or four people. Now we're up to almost 10 people. It's getting really important that everyone has a turn at doing this process. It's also better because of this principle we call small batches. Small batches are better. If you do a failover like this once a year, then there's a whole batch of changes that have happened to the infrastructure. And all of the, every one of those changes is a risk that could mess up your, your procedure that worked fine last year. Well, this year is different. 
So if you do your drills repeatedly or more frequently, each drill is testing a smaller batch of changes to your infrastructure. And this goes for infrastructure. It also goes for software development. Re remember, like, traditional software. Remember, like, Microsoft Office, new release every two or three years. And in 1997, uh, I was actually not directly involved in rolling it out to a very large company, but I was, uh, I was there when halfway through the rollout, it, um, uh, it got messed up. Um, there were incompatibility issues that hadn't been discovered in testing. And literally a 50,000 person company was stranded, half of the company upgraded, half not. Um, it was very expensive, you know, these mistakes are very visible, and, um, and also, it's a long delay between when you write the code and when the feature is available, right? Can you imagine, right, remember before word processors underlined misspelled words? Can you imagine being the person that wrote the code to do that? And then it's like, pat on the back, good job at writing that code. Two years from now, people are going to be able to see that. What a sad life, <laughs> right? But if you're doing your software releases constantly, and in, in distributed computing, you have to, because you're, you're rolling it out to thousands of machines um, uh, you, in fact, you might have many releases per day. Um, the lead time between when you write code and when it's in production becomes smaller and smaller. So you might have monthly releases or weekly releases or daily releases, or you might be like Etsy.com over in Brooklyn, who recently announced that in 2014, they had 9,000 software pushes. That's every couple minutes during the day they had new releases pushed. In fact, on your first day as an employee at Etsy, um, they walk you over to a terminal and you update uh, some code. You add your name and picture to a web page and you push that code into production because they want to be very clear to every new employee that uh, we're all about pushing new code. And, it, and that, that change is detected. It's run through a battery of tests and then pushed to production. So they have the confidence to do this, right? So it's not just about, um, isn't it nice that we did 9,000 a year? It's that we have the confidence in our testing system that we can do that. And that's a game changer. And that's, uh, we talk a lot about that and in, in the book. And especially, I mean, this is, this is the benefit of the small batches um, because things become uh, fully automated, um, less risky. In fact, changes become cheap and that encourages experimentation. So instead of saying, well, we'd like to do that feature, but you know, it's so expensive to push out a new software release, we can say, hmm, that sounds like a good idea. Uh, let's try an experiment. Let's try that setting at, actually, this is something that we're doing at Stack right now. There's a, it's a long story, but the short version is we're doing something with our ads that happens 20% of the time, and we're thinking, hmm, maybe we'll try it at, 50% or 80% of the time, different days of the week, and measure the change. We'll do a little experiment and see what works better. And we can do that because we are able to push software into production very cheaply. So big bang releases are very risky, but small batches are better. And uh, as I said before, they're better because we have fewer changes in each batch. Um, but also this means if there's a bug, you know where it is. Et Etsy doing a push for every little change, if there's a bug, they know which change it was because they only had one change in that release, right? Um, it also reduces lead time, as I mentioned, but this means your developers are more productive because they're debugging code that they wrote very recently. Ever try to fix a bug in code that you wrote a year ago? It's really hard. Um, your environment has changed less, as I mentioned with the fewer infrastructure changes. And what makes me excited about this is the recent study from psychologists that find that your employees are happier and more motivated when you're in a, a small batch environment. And that's because of the instant gratification. That person that wrote the thing that underlines misspelled words in red, that feature gets out very quickly. So it's instant gratification. It's also less stressful for system administrators, right? In a big batch environment, you, you do like a yearly release and it's a month of hell, right? Like an honest job ad for a lot of system administration procedures should say, 
uh, positions should say, you know, come work for us, great company, great benefits. Oh, and by the way, two months a year, you will want to die. <laughs> and we're not sure which two months those are going to be, so you're never really going to schedule a vacation, and you'll want to die even more. Right? That would be an honest job ad for most system administration positions. And so if you are in a small batch environment, you have that better confidence in your ability to push new code, which makes your life as a system administrator less stressful, happier, you can schedule vacations, et cetera, et cetera. I'm scheduling a two-month, uh, oops, two-week vacation in July. Very excited. Small batches rule. Um, risks are inversely proportional to how often a procedure has been used, right? If you've never done a backup from your, if you've never done a restore from your backup system, it's very risky, right? But if you're doing restores all the time, then you have confidence in that system. We do a full restore of our backups every night at Stack Exchange. It's an automated procedure. It does a restore of the database to um, a test machine, does a couple queries. We're very confident in our backups. You know who's really good at this? Netflix. Netflix has Chaos Monkey. Now, Netflix totally runs out of Amazon AWS. And Chaos Monkey, every day, picks a machine at random, a virtual machine at random, and deletes it. And it tests this, their infrastructure's ability to detect that, to rebuild the new machine, you know, the replacement, and make sure everything you know, comes, comes back together. Uh, it's an opt-in system, but departments don't want to be on the, the opt-out list, right? You know, because that looks bad. Like, why are you the only people they're opting out? Um, also, the system, Chaos Monkey, they only run it during the day, 9 to 5, Monday through Friday. <laughs> because if there is a problem, they want to discover, if they have to do a major debugging, you want to discover that when everyone is awake, at, in the office, and sober, theoretically. <laughs> right? You don't want to learn these things at 4 in the morning on a Tuesday, or even worse, you don't want to learn this when the new episode of uh, House of Cards is, is putting pressure on the system, right? right? So um, anyone here work for HBO Go? Yeah, so Google for uh, HBO Go and um, Major League Baseball. You'll, you'll find... Uh, they, they don't have Chaos Monkey there. Um, so with the success of Chaos Monkey, they uh, built Chaos Kong, which simulates data centers being down. Um, not run every day, 9 to 5, but is run in, on occasions. And Latency Monkey, which adds random delays to their um, API calls which means that they're going to discover that protocol that works great in test but doesn't work so well on the night that House of Cards you know, has a new episode. Um, they're going to learn about that during the day. All of this has been open source. You can get it all on GitHub. Cool stuff. So have I convinced you if a procedure is risky, do it often? Awesome. Okay. Cool. And let's... Now in the end, the, the final stretch, don't punish people for outages. Um, you know, with every uh, Stack Exchange website, oh, something I didn't mention about Stack Exchange, um, uh, you're all familiar with uh, Stack Overflow, the, the programming site, but you know, we have 140 question and answer sites. Um, parenting, pets, uh, every major world religion, um, vegetarianism, um, I can't name them all. And if you, um, and most of them have a blog associated with it that the community runs, not us. Um, and they almost all have a chat room associated with it uh, so that the community can chat. Um, so this morning there was an outage uh, in our chat system. That was me. Um, <laughs> and uh, luckily my employer does not punish people for outages. So let's talk about that. Um, there will always be outages, right? Earlier I talked about everything's imperfect. Everything's going to fail. Um, getting angry about outages is equivalent to expecting them to never happen, which is irrational. 
And yet, we have these outdated attitudes in this industry about outages. We have managers that say, you know, I want 100% uptime. Not only do I want 100% uptime, which we know is impossible, everything fails, but I'm going to ask for this impossible thing, and to prove I'm serious, people will be punished if we deviate from that 100%, right? And as a result, what do people do? Well, someone get, does get fired, and everyone reacts. They start hiding problems. They communicate less. Uh, we eliminate any transparency. The dashboard for our service, you can only see it if you log in, and we control who can see it, right? And small problems start getting ignored because no one wants to touch, you know, last touched it gets blamed, right? So small problems get ignored, and they turn into big problems. So this manager that thought that they were doing a good thing by saying, this is how serious I am about outages, has created the exact environment that describes a company that has lots of failures, right? So a more modern thinking about outages is to embrace them and say, okay, a realistic uptime goal is, let's say, 99.9% .9 plus or minus 5%. In fact, at some companies, they say, if you exceed your uptime goal by too much, there's penalties for that because, well, that means you're spending too much on resources or you've somehow, uh, like you, you have too many machines under the load balancer, and that's wasting company money. Or you've achieved this stability by terrifying the developers so that they don't want to do any um, uh, software pushes, and that's not good either. That uh, delays new features. So, um, so a much more realistic uptime goal, and instead of being surprised by an outage, we're going to anticipate them. We're going to be strategic about them. We're going to have a system that's designed from the ground up to be resilient to failures. We're going to have an on-call system, uh, a rotation where one person's on duty at any time instead of everyone being on call and everyone being afraid to go to sleep. And we're going to do these fire drills to keep in practice so that processes keep improving. And as a result, this creates a culture, an environment, where transparency is encouraged. You'll see, you know, everyone's dashboard is available for view by everyone, right? Um, people communicate more. Small problems are fixed when they're small, so you don't, so that prevents the majority of big problems. And overall uptime is improved. This is a much more modern thinking about outages. And, you know, in, in the first draft of the book, I had this paragraph that said, um, it's as if there are, like, 1950s management books told employers, anytime there's a problem, fire the person responsible, and eventually you'll have a company that only employs perfect people. <laughs> and one of my co-authors uh, co deleted the paragraph. She said, Tom, no, no one actually believes that. And I said, okay, maybe it's a bit of a hyperbole. And then came healthcare.gov, the big outage when it launched. And what was the media saying? The media was saying, who is Obama going to fire to prove he's serious? Right. right? We as a culture expect these outdated attitudes about outages. But you know, when Mikey Dickens, uh, Dixon uh, took a sabbatical from Google and joined uh, the project to help well, it was part of a, a group of people that uh, took sabbaticals to, to help uh, relaunch the site. Um, if you've seen the talk he gave at um, uh, Usenix Lisa or other places, it, you can get it on YouTube. He says the first time he met with all the people involved, the first thing he said was, I want to assure you, none of you here are going to be fired because the people in the room right now are the most qualified people to fix these problems. That is a mature attitude on outages. And they worked day by day, slowly, and they turned it around, right? Another modern thinking about outages is there is no root cause. People talk about, what's the root cause? Well, there are no root causes. There are just contributing factors. Nothing in the universe happens because one thing, right? Good things don't happen because of one thing, 
And bad things don't happen because of one thing either. So if your company doubled sales last year, can you say one thing made that happen? No. You rolled out some new products. You got a new VP of, of sales. Uh, you fixed some bugs. You started a new marketing campaign. The economy got better. All these things came together for one good thing to happen. And similarly, one bad thing doesn't happen because of one thing. So it's not that Tom typed the wrong command. It's Tom typed the wrong command, and the command doesn't have sufficient error checking. And the system is not resilient to human error, which we know will happen, or human errors of that kind. And Tom typed the wrong command because the documentation told him to. And there's a bug that says the documentation needs to be updated, but that bug's been sitting there for six months. Right? All these things came together to make that outage happen. So instead of looking for blame, we write postmortems that are blameless. So uh, you know, blameful postmortems are, are uh, blaming and shaming the guilty. But a blameless postmortem is where we focus on learning what happened and how can we improve in the future. So um, and. And also, an interesting thing about writing postmortems is instead of hiding our problems, we're, gonna, we're not going to hide it. We're going to do the opposite. We're going to write up a big document about it, and then we're going to email that document to everyone in the company because it's blameless and we all want to learn. So, um, right, so the postmortem identifies what happened, how it happened, and what can be done to prevent it in the future. And because we email this document around, the whole organization gets smarter, right? So you might have five, 10, or like at Google, they probably have a thousand sysadmin teams. And every time they write a postmortem, it educates everybody. So maybe this one team learned, oh, there's a certain kind of cascading failure that is typical in distributed computing, and here's how we could prevent it in the future. Now all the other teams benefit from that. So the organization actually gets smarter with every outage. That's pretty cool. So instead of focusing on blame, we focus on responsibility. Responsibility for fixing the problem and for educating everyone so that, the, so that we get that organizational improvement. So this is a postmortem that Stack Exchange wrote in August. On August 25th, there was a seven minute outage. Um, we use a, a template so that it's very easy to get started in writing the, the postmortem. One click and you are already beginning. Um, the format is very simple. It begins with a summary, which is a, uh, a lay person's description of what happened. Uh, we have a, a table that we fill out that explains the, the summary statement in table form. Then we have a section called background information. This is everything a layperson would need to know to be able to understand the rest of this document. Then the timeline, minute by minute accounting of what happened. So at 1901, a change was pushed into Git, Puppet pushed it out, seven minutes later, um, I got paged, I was on call, David, our boss, gone, went into the chat room asking why is everything down except the chat room. Um, <laughs> Change was being reverted, actually, as he was asking that question, Puppet pushed out the change, and seven minutes total, we were back up and running. After the timeline, I think these are the four most important parts of the document. It's, it's two and two. First two are what went right, what needs improvement, and the last two are what do we need to do right away, and what do we need to do in the long term to prevent these problems. So things did go right. The team communicated really well. We used Git for our Puppet configuration, so we were able to revert very quickly. There were some things that needed to be improved. We basically have no automated testing of the firewall rules, and the manual system is kind of catch as catch can. Um, so some obvious short-term and long-term improvements that need to be done. And as a result of sending this out to the company, uh, a coworker hit reply all and sent this message. I don't know about anyone else, but I really like getting these postmortem reports. Not only is it nice to know what happened, but it's also great to see how you guys handled it in the moment and how you plan to prevent these events going forward. 
Really neato. Thanks for great work. I'm really proud to work at a company where after an outage, the email I get from a coworker says, really neato. Thanks for the great work. Right? That's cool. So, don't punish people for outages. Have I convinced you of this? <laughs> Very good. So, thank you. Um, so, the take-homes are cloud computing. Nice marketing term, but we're technical people. We know that this is really about distributed computing. And whether it's thousands of machines or the enterprise, all of these techniques um, are, are trickling, trickling down. I hate that analogy. Um, they're spreading around. Um, use cheaper, less reliable hardware, because when given the choice, we want to do our resiliency through software, um, and we only want to pay for the resiliency that we need. As a process, if a process or procedure is risky, do it a lot, because the scientific term for improvement through repeated iterations is practice makes perfect. Um, and the small batches principle then kicks in improving not only the quality, but morale and stress. And lastly, don't punish people for outages. We want to focus on accountability and taking responsibility. Now, some of you didn't applaud, so I might not have convinced all of you. And um, I want to say that these are the techniques that are the fundamental, uh, the, many of the fundamentals of uh, the DevOps methodology. And these uh, all come from um, a lot of the philosophies you've heard tonight are what feeds into the DevOps world. And that kind of stuff is not necessarily new. It's not um, these crazy new, peop new ideas. These actually come from the Toyota manufacturing methodology that started in the 1950s. So this has been around for a long time. Um, that me those methodologies lean resulted in the lean manufacturing methodology and the lean startup methodology. And if that doesn't convince you, these are also the techniques that we use in our daily life. If you think about it, um, we build resiliency where needed, not everywhere. Uh, that's how we build our houses. We don't put a strong lock on every interior door. We make a solid front door, and that permits us to be vulnerable inside. Um, oops. We manage risk through repetition. If the only big meal that you cook each year is Thanksgiving, then Thanksgiving Day is going to be very stressful. But if you cook meals often, the cooking is less risky and less stressful for everybody. Um, <laughs> similarly, <laughs> Similarly, in our relationships, if you avoid having those difficult conversations, then they become very hard. But um, if you make a point to have those small, difficult conversations, then when you have to have a big, difficult conversation, it's much easier. We have the, the social tools in place to do them, because we're used to that. Um, and. Um, Lastly, when we deal with problems when they're small, oh, I'm sorry. Lastly, expecting loved ones to be perfect is irrational, right? And that's why every healthy relationship has built in um, healthy portions of forgiveness, right? So maybe these aren't the radical ideas from the book. Maybe these are actually the, um, the very reasonable ideas from the book. And I hope that you enjoyed this talk and that you can uh, use these techniques in your IT organization. Thank you very much. All, all right. I expect uh, there are some questions. So I'm gonna, I've got this mic on. So if people want to start lining up here, I'll go turn that one on. And uh, please ask Tom any questions you might have. Very nice presentation. Thank you. Uh, by the way, you'll find a lot of literature on this in the after action review concept in the military. Mm -hmm. That yes. goes back even further than Toyota. Yes, some of the best writing on, um, on post mortems comes from the um, 
the aviation field. Yes. And in fact, there's a great book, and I'm not going to get the title right, but it's something like The Anatomy of Human Error or something like that. It's The Something of Human Error, and it's by someone who uh, studies airplane crashes and the lessons learned oh, yeah. from well, his book in the, uh, apply in, all In the military, place. there's a very big thing about uh, we want to find out what went wrong and fix it, not shoot people. Right, right. Uh, an observation, though, which I'm sure you'll agree with, there's cheap and there's too cheap. Yes. You can all, it's great to buy, you have to be very careful. There's a line there where if you buy it too cheap, your fire drill to replace failed elements will quickly overwhelm you. You have to buy cheap enough. Yes. You're right, exactly. And that's why you want to um, have an SLA defined so that you know you, ha you have a target to shoot for. And the last item on this, because I've got building up a tail finally, is you didn't mention the advantages of having play pens. How I what? Play pens. Play pens. Sand sandbox. Sandbox. Sand well, I, I, I avoid sandboxes. That means something else. Uh, small clouds that you can play rather than taking oh. a chance with your 10,000 machine production cloud. Mm -hmm. You should always try things in a playpen before oh, oh, you go sure. and blow up the production site. Yes. Yeah, um, yeah, we have a whole chapter about, um, about the need to have a QA and a test and a production environment that are separate. And as I'm writing this, I'm like, doesn't everyone know this? And then I'm like, you know, getting emails from right. mailing lists where people are like, oh, so we tried this thing in production and it didn't work and we were so surprised. And it's like, yeah. yeah, I mentioned so I quite a few of these in my uh, book chapter 20 years ago on internet security. Yes, absolutely. Um, I think you were at the mic first. Uh, yeah, I, I enjoyed the talk, thank you. And uh, I think that to a large extent, um, if you have one product that everybody's focusing on, one stack, it, it makes a lot of sense to do failover like this, to spend a lot of time optimizing it. But I've worked at a couple places that have lots of products that you're responsible for, lots of stacks, and it's a lot harder to really focus on one in such a complete way. Do you have any advice for how to approach that situation? Yeah, um, we have a whole assessment system. Uh, chapter 20 gives you a way of evaluating, say, say you have, say you're responsible for 10 services or, or 100 services. It has a, a methodology for evaluating uh, seven key factors about a service, and if you do this assessment, say once a month, you can see uh, how it's how it's improving over time, or what needs the most work. Um, and you could actually um, so it gives you a basis of comparison and, and helps you allocate resources. Which what you're really describing is I can't be everywhere at once. Where should I be? Right. But even even with different products, not mm -hmm. just the same product, but Ten serv a thousand services on that one thing. Okay. Um, all right. Yeah, yeah. And also, if you can convince all teams to use this methodology, you can then okay. even roll it up on a on a team level and see which teams are struggling and need more resources and stuff. So, um, yeah, check it out. Uh, yes. Hi. Great talk, Tom. Um, when you were talking about the uh, the bad RAM, I had heard you talk about this concept before, and I have a couple of questions if you don't mind. So in disk, you know, we can mark a sector bad, and Smart usually does that automatically, and blah, blah, blah. Um, Linux will let you mark bad sectors in the kernel in a config file, and you also program like EDAC or the newer uh, MCE log that'll um, detect uh, uh, single error correction, double error detections. However, the, the hashing on the data structure seems awfully difficult. Um, I was talking to a fellow about doing this in Malik the other day. Um, there's a blog post by the, one of the developers on Redis who was talking about having similar RAM problems where he was trying to do a, like a, a CRC64 across the thing. But the caches seem to cause a lot of problems when you're doing that. You can't, you have to cache bust to be able to, to do a, a CRC check on, across the RAM. Can you maybe tell us any more about how you've seen this done in the past? Um, so the, the issue that you're raising is if you're constantly checksumming memory, then you're, you're, that's going to affect performance because of cache hits and, and other things. Well, either it's not going to work because you're staying in the cache or else you're busting oh. the cache and it's going to kill your performance if you're doing it on live data. So right. right. To, to do it right, cache. you have to be bus busting the cache. Right. So first, as a way of disclaimer, uh, Google did that before I joined in 2006. 
and I, so I wasn't involved in, in creating it, and actually they stopped doing it by the time I, I joined. So, um, uh, I th but I believe what they were doing was they were depending on um, a couple things. One is they were looking for uh, parity errors and using that as the first signal to, to block something out. And then um, I believe the checksumming was like a periodic pass through the database or, or, um, or probabilistic, like every you know, nth time that they read a data structure, they would read the checksum first, then read the data out of it. Um, and since they were gonna be reading it anyway, it was entering the cache. Um, but, I, but I'm totally guessing right now. Um, I'd like to not get into this, so is there a different question? <laughs> You have to recompute the CRC every time you update a value in the data structure. Otherwise, you can't tell if it's real or imagined. Thank you. So I have a sorry, an unrelated question. Um, so my question is, you'd mentioned utilization on servers, and I think one of the other things people uh, do in the cloud initially is they spin up instances rather than spin up multiple services and manage multiple services to increase utilization. A lot of uh, small to medium companies, for instance, don't necessarily have. Uh, the need to scale horizontally and, and actually benefit from ways to do, you know, whatever kind of bin packing they can. And I was wondering if you discussed um, calculating uh, utilization or strategies to better utilize systems. Uh, sure. So strategies for calculating utilization. Um, when you asked that question, it made me think about <clears throat> how do you plan for the future? We, we currently are fine on end machines next year at this time or we need n times two or n times 100 machines or, or n plus one, right? Um, so there's actual, uh, there are actual capacity planning formulas um, and we actually list, uh, actually the most colorful part of the book has graphs of capacities and, and shows the formulas for predicting growth, you know, um, based on past performance. And then of course you have to factor in, you know, sales and marketing information that, you know, um, you could actually ignore the formulas and just go by, well, marketing says that their, their expectation is to grow this, this fast at this rate. Um, and then you could do like um, uh, data flow analysis to see, you, you eventually come up with this formula that says for every thousand requests per second, we need, you know, five of these, four of these, and one and a half of those. And that gives you, you know, assuming a linear scaling, that gives you a way of predicting maybe your, your disk and RAM and, and other things. Yeah. <clears throat> yes. Is there uh, any hope for us who are not quite this modern? Um, any kind of tips or tricks to like where it might be five, ten years before we could start doing something like this? Absolutely, because no, no company, so you're the majority, right? 99.9% .9 of the world um, is, uh, is, is in your situation. So uh, the most important thing is, uh, I'll give you two bits of advice. One is start small. Find the one thing that's going to reduce pain in your life and fix that and use that as, as evidence that um, the system works and can, can grow. Um, the other thing is uh, find a partner. So find someone else in another team, say if you are the operations team and most of what you're doing is produced by a developer team, uh, take their lead developer or someone that you know in that team, get outside of work, you know, go to lunch or you know, just get away from the computers and have a heart-to-heart -heart talk and say, you know, I bet between you and I we could come up with some simple project that, you know, or a, pain point that we both have that we can um, eliminate. And once you start partnering, you, you can move a lot faster. So in fact, that's how a lot of this continuous integration, continuous deploy stuff uh, gets started. You know, the operations person says, it's driving me nuts that, you know, the way we release source code is the developers literally give us source code, like, you know, in email that we, that we have to, you know, compile and package and put into development. And half the times, 
you know, when Larry is the one that emails to us, he uses 7-zip and we have to find a Windows box and, you know, God knows what. Um, can we just get that one thing to be, you know, automated um, or, or at least consistent? Um, and that's how you start a relationship and, and improve things. Thank you. Sure. Yes. Hi. The great thing about the cloud, in my opinion, is you can roll out systems really fast. Yes. The worst thing about the cloud is you can roll out systems really fast. <laughs> yeah. And do you have any guidelines and best practices on how to kind of assess your environment, see where the all you can eat buffet has leftovers and clean that up? Oh, so how to make sure that people aren't wasting resources? Yeah, the, or, or are you looking for ways to roll out software in a, a sane way that... E either software or business practices to assess servers and say, you asked for 400 LPARs, or I'm mm -hmm. AX guy, VMs, and said, okay, let's, um, are you using them? Right. Because we built the infrastructure to support this environment, and half the environment is forgotten about in dead projects. Right. So um, two bits of advice. One is every service needs to have an SLA, because if it has an SLA, then you can, um, uh, your, part of that SLA should include um, machine efficiency, or resource efficiency. So you can um, also, because you're monitoring based on an SLA, now things don't get lost. Um, so I would find one project, um, come up with a, a definition of an SLA, a way to monitor it, and a way to alert about it, and make that your success story, and then show other people, hey, this worked really well for us, and we're saving money, and we're up, or whatever, you know, list all the benefits, and then people will want to clone that, and they'll copy your, the way that you did that, or you can replicate that other places. And I guess I would add a business owner, because somebody needs to be the one in charge to make that call. Right. You get 10 <clears throat> Indians and nobody making the decision. Yeah, and um, absolutely, your SLA should come, should be, um, agreed upon by the business owner so that they have an appreciation for what you're trying to achieve with efficiency and, and stuff. I, I recently on a mailing list said something about um, if a service doesn't have an SLA, then the SLA, th then that means that the service isn't needed and, and I was a bit flipped, but I said, you should just shut off the, the service and see who complains because then you'll know what the SLA is, right? <laughs> and if, if, if someone says, Especially if someone says, this service isn't important, it doesn't need an SLA, you have to translate that to mean, I can shut that off when this meeting is concluded, right? Because otherwise, then we're just wasting resources and running things. E even if that SLA is, you know, five hour best effort or a hundred hour best effort, um, you, you have to have an SLA, otherwise, you, I, everything, the way to be data driven is, to start with an SLA uh, and measure everything against that. Yeah. Yes? This is just kind of a continuation of the previous question as a exp exp expansion of the response. One other important thing to keep in mind, and every sysadmin I know, myself being guilty of this as well, is saying, oh, those damn developers are doing this. Realize that there's another human being in that team. And it's astounding, to your point, if you go out for beers or lunch one night and just start commiserating how quickly you can solve problems because the problem you have may be the same problem they have and you blame them and they blame you, but because you've never sat down and talked, you never <laughs> solve the problem. And sometimes just 10 minutes over a beer can solve an amazing amount of problems. Yeah, I, I totally agree. Um, if you come to DevOps days, um, I'm giving an Ignite talk about a time at Google where I was in a process that involved 12 teams and the, the process had 27 handoffs. And none of, probably 10 of those 12 teams didn't know that they were part of this process. They just got tickets every once in a while asking for some weird thing and they just saw, oh, that team, they always ask for that. I wonder what it is. And we, um, and we sat, we had those meetings where we sat down Actually, we flew to the various offices so we could have sit-downs with each of these, and we showed them the big graph of the 27 handoffs, and we showed, you are these three circles, and um, we were able to get so much done by just getting a, an understanding of you know, 
the whole picture. Yeah. Hey, Tom. Hey. Uh, so a quick question for you. Um, I've been in situations where I've uh, given advice on potential issues that are going to occur. We have some rollouts, software rollouts. And the response is, oh, we'll, we'll wait for it to happen. And then once it happens, we'll fix it. Uh, what advice can, do you have to kind of, you know, get a bigger buy, a better buy-in at that, the time when it's, the advisement is made or, you know? Good, good point. Um, so the second, uh, there's, there's the three ways of DevOps, and the second of those ways is, um, uh, is about uh, amplifying um, communication. So the problem there is that person doesn't care because when they have a problem, um, they're not going to get woken up. Right? It's going to happen at 4 in the morning, and you're going to be woken up, not them. So there's a bunch of techniques in the, the DevOps methodology to um, amplify uh, problems instead of hiding them or, or being the hero. Oh, I'll fix it and then go back to sleep, and no one knows that I'm, I'm the hero, but I'm just you know, hating my life. Um, so one thing you can do is you can have uh, developers have to carry the pager one, one week a month or something. Um, you can also, you need to make sure that there is a, um, a bug tracking system that every team you interact with, you know how to report problems. Often problems go unreported just because there's no knowledge of how to report the problems. Um, and then you need everyone on your team to be dedicated to file problems. Anytime you hear someone says, oh, they know that's a problem, challenge them on that and say, if there's no bug filed, then we don't know. You know, Maybe the developers know that there's a problem, but their manager who's allocating their time doesn't know there's a problem. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask the last question over here. Last question. Sure. Thank you very much. Um, some, sometimes when I we talk about DevOps, an excuse that people give is, well, you know, Google can do that because they've just got one app. Stack Exchange can do that because they've just got one app. But I really don't believe that, right? No, right, absolutely. Uh, especially in, so people think of Stack Exchange as one app. By the way, we're two apps because we also have careers.stackexchange.com. Anyone you looking to hire or be hired. Um, but uh, every service is made up of lots of little services. Um, Google, people say, oh, they're a unicorn. No one, no one else is like that. That doesn't apply. Um, all of these things trickle down, and, and I think the important thing is, believe it or not, my recommendation is don't say, hey, let's adopt DevOps. People hear that word, and they're like, they don't know what it is, or they have some misconception of it. So instead, come to them saying, hey, here's a problem that's creating pain for you and me, and here's a technique that would fix it. And once you've done that a couple times, you can tell them, you know, I've slowly converted you over to DevOps. You had no idea. <laughs> All right, great. so I think we have trivia time. But thank you, Tom, for the... Oh, right, uh, trivia time. Thank, thank you everyone. very much. So, it's, um, so, so quickly, the, the rules of trivia are that Tom has questions. Um, hopefully, uh, you and the audience have answers. I'm going to try to just select the first person who puts their hand up, and you get to answer the question. Please don't shout anything out. People get very... Um, that would be weird. Yeah, and you know, you're not if you if, if you didn't get called on if it's not your hand, it's it's not your answer. Um, can we get the house lights up again? Thanks. And so we have uh, three books over here. Unfortunately, none of them are Tom's books, but we have um, which we have had Wiley send us in the past, but we we give them away, so we kind of do what we're asked in that respect. But we have uh, Effective Python, Linux Firewalls, and a Practical Guide to Ubuntu Linux, and three uh, O'Reilly and Associates vouchers. So. Um, if you have the answer, then you get to choose from those. Uh, the last person gets what's left. Okay. Um, and choose whichever. I know you have more questions than we have giveaways, so it's up to you. Okay. First question's easy. Um, name the. What is the last name of any of my co-authors? There's two. Um, I'm right here, and I saw you over here, sir. Logan. Very good. Yes. All right. Christine. Um, left system administration to design Formula One race cars, but she's back in system administration now. True fact. <laughs> All right. Uh, second question. Um, they're on a Google Doc. Uh, 
and I didn't hook up to the Wi-Fi, so I'm... Oh, do you want, uh, do you want um, me to pull that up? Did you print them out? No, I didn't, but I... Oh, you got... Okay. I got uh, myself next, online What was here. the name of the, um, my coworker who sent that nice email? Good job. Um, over there, back shirt and blue shirt? Yeah. Congrats, yes. I had this up a moment ago, so I can... Uh, oh, know. awesome. Yay, technology. Yay. Okay. So while you're... Should I start with the next one? Yeah, please you're... go right ahead. Okay. I'm just going to um, and favor different parts of the room. Uh, the first fire drill at Stack Exchange took um, more than how many hours to complete? You in the back there with the blue and white shirt? Yeah. Yes. Awesome. And congrats. I'll, I'll autograph other people's books, by the way. <laughs> um, instead of saying root cause, we should say... Uh, in the back here? Contributing factors? Yes. Is oh. that... How many is that? Uh, well, we have, that, uh, I think that was four at this point, and we okay. have uh, at least one book left and a, couple, a voucher or two. Let me see. Uh, no, I think that was uh, three. So you have three more questions. Or okay. two more. I'm sorry. It is two more because he two gets his choice. Two more questions. Um, Tom described getting angry that outages happen using what word? I think he was first. Irrational. Awesome. Okay. And I'm going to end on... Why do we heart the cloud? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Did you share the doc with him? I, I didn't even remember that part when I read it. <laughs> All right. Thank you, everyone. So come on up, grab. Um, I, at this point, you have a Ubuntu book as your option, so I hope that this is uh, good for you. No All right, awesome. Thank you, everyone. So we're going to be heading over to Bloom's Tavern. Please um, glom on to a group if you don't know where it is or meet us there. We'll be upstairs if you do know where that is. Uh, see you there, hopefully. And if not, see you next time.